Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Brilliant. There will be spoilers for Fallout Season 1. I'm not the first person to say this, but I was not expecting to enjoy this as much as I did. And maybe I should have. I enjoy most of the Fallout games, including the underrated Fallout tactics that I really wish more people would play, and I like a lot of the previous work of producer Jonathan Nolan. Westworld's first season was great, but I find his older show Person of Interest to be an especially good time, which I think gets overlooked because it was on CBS and had such a boring title. Still, my innate skepticism of video game adaptations kicked in, and I was fully prepared to be let down. And while I don't think it's a perfect show, and there is room for season 2 to improve, overall I was really, really engaged by the characters in this one. Yellow Jacket's Ella Pernal anchored the series really well, endowing Lucy McLean with both a comedic naivete and genuine moral backbone in the face of cruelty that elevated that character above the bland do-gooder that she could have been. Aaron Moten's Maximus provided an interesting character arc even if I think his transformation into a more truly heroic figure felt a little bit rushed at times. But I think the MVP of the show, and really the character that serves as the through line between the show's two distinct time periods, is Walton Goggins Cooper Howard, aka The Ghoul. Our American way of life, isn't it grand? Peace, freedom, and bacon and eggs. In this video, I really want to talk about the ghoul from a few perspectives. I'm not sure how intentional it was, but I think there's a clever commentary on the western to be found in the character of Cooper Howard. An actor who made his mark by playing uncomplicated, straightforward heroes of 1950s style westerns. While in the post-apocalyptic present day, he's this gruff, often merciless bounty hunter. The kind of cowboy who had a heart once, but one that, when we meet him, has been calloused over by years of the harsh realities of the desert. Something far more akin to a 60s or 70s spaghetti western protagonist that actors like Clint Eastwood or Charles Bronson would often play. Now, for the record, the best of those 50s westerns were far more morally complex than they're usually given credit for these days, but those archetypes are fairly accurate in the broadest sense, and Fallout does a good job of using both aspects of them. Now, the Cooper Howard of the pre-bombs era is not a perfect man. He allows himself to get pushed around and paid off by vault tech into basically being a mouthpiece for an evil that he can barely comprehend. And we get an indication of how malleable he is early on when he's talked into filming a violent scene he felt uncomfortable with. But in his defense, you always get the sense that he genuinely wants to believe the best in people, especially, and understandably, Barb. He took action too late, and we don't know exactly what happened after he discovered his wife's complicity in the world's destruction, but judging by the opening scene where he's no longer getting work and reduced to doing children's birthday parties, it seems he was willing to lose everything to do the right thing. So I think there's some nice irony to his harsh relationship with Lucy when they first meet. In a show filled with hypocrisy, hidden under the layers of seemingly caring facades, it's the irradiated face of the ghoul that once represented something closer to those old-fashioned values of decency and honor that Lucy tries so hard to cling to. There's that moment she decides that she and Maximus cannot keep the fusion core from Vault 4, and that her father would be horrified that she sacrificed an entire community just to save him. We come to learn that that's not true, that's the exact kind of cold calculation that her father made when destroying Shady Sands. But you know who would have been genuinely horrified by that prospect, just like Lucy was? The Cooper Howard of the past. But the last 200 years have, at least for a time, stripped them from him. And on the surface at least, he's become as cruel and mercenary as the world around him. That I think is the ultimate tragedy of the character. And even though there's a sci-fi element to it, I do feel like it draws upon that old western tradition of the fallen, jaded hero. A movie that randomly kept popping into my head throughout the show was Sam Peckinpah's Ride the High Country, a great film from the early 60s that often gets overlooked in favor of the director's magnum opus, The Wild Bunch. In it, Guild is one of the two leads, a former lawman who has fallen on hard times and now lives only for the next chance to score some cash. 
There's a sense in both the ghoul and Gil that they've given up on their old ideals long ago, only for an act of selflessness to shake them from their self-imposed cynicism. In the ghoul's case, it's Lucy, a woman he was absolutely awful to before selling her to an organ harvester, saving him from losing his mind and going feral despite that and showing that even though much of the wasteland is brutish and horrible, she still can and will hold herself to a higher moral standard than that. It's a great moment, and marks a small but significant turning point for the ghoul that seems to return at least a little bit of that to him, even if that edge and harshness still remains. Of course, the ghoul isn't all melancholy and sadness. There's a big element of the badass gunslinger bounty hunter to him, and that's something that I'll always be happy to watch Goggins play on TV, because Walton Goggins is a true television star. Sure, he's been in plenty of movies, from the forgettable Tomb Raider reboot, to The Bourne Identity, to Tarantino's underrated masterpiece The Hateful Eight, but it's TV that has given Goggins the most wide-ranging, star-making characters, and he has a knack for playing complex, unpredictable, and often evil men. From Shane, the dirty cop on his breakout role in The Shield, to Justified's Boyd Crowder, a vicious criminal leader with a complicated, heartfelt relationship with the show's main character, Raylan Givens. With both these roles in mind, it was easy to see that he could bring a sense of gravitas and knowing humor to a scene like the big shootout in Episode 2 and do it in style. But the earlier version of Howard also gives Goggins the chance to play someone far more earnest and really different from either Justified or the Weasley untrustworthy losers that he excels at playing in shows like Vice Principals and Righteous Gemstones. Cooper Howard feels more like the type of performance he'd be asked to give had Goggins actually been a star during the 50s studio era. Speaking of which, I think it's worth at least digging in a little bit into this show's depiction of Hollywood. In many ways, obviously, it's different than our own, with westerns still being a major part of the studio's slate. But the fact that it's a dying Hollywood, that's basically being bought out wholesale by Robco and by extension vault Tech, definitely felt like a pointed commentary on our own. And the fact that it came out the same week as that damning Harper's Magazine article about the state of the industry being bought out by private equity and the show being on Amazon Prime really only added to that feeling. But let's get back to Cooper himself and where the ghoul goes from here. A lot of streaming shows these days feel like movie scripts that have been broken apart and expanded on to fit into a television format, which can result in the show clearly having nowhere to go after season one, its concepts and ideas already spent. One thing I really appreciated about Fallout is that it doesn't seem like that's the case at all. Fallout was obviously created with a multi-season story in mind, and its finale leaves a lot more plot threads dangling than just the New Vegas tease. For the ghoul, the biggest revelation is that he's been looking for his family this entire time. Now, 200 years seems like a long time for that, but in his own words that perfectly reflect the games themselves, the wasteland has its own golden rule. Thou shalt get sidetracked by bullshit every goddamn time. But now, he seems to have a renewed sense of purpose, and it appears that Season 2 will see him and Lucy as genuine allies, with Maximus adjusting to his newfound power within the Brotherhood. I think this is a really exciting setup, because going back through the season, Lucy and the Ghoul spent less time together than I'd really remembered, and we've never seen them on equal footing before. It's a pairing that I'm excited to watch play out. The show also did a good job of getting me invested in the mystery of what happened to Barb and Janie. Especially Janie, who was such a major part of the show's incredibly effective opening scene. New Vegas should provide plenty of great characters as well, being one of the game series more fleshed out and interesting settings. While I know that some fans took issue with some of the lore inconsistencies and stuff in Season 1, and I can honestly understand that if you're deeply invested in it and Bethesda itself is insisting that the show is canon to the video games, taken on its own terms though, I think it does a great job of creating moral quandaries and situations that feel straight out of an RPG, while never being so beholden to the stories that the game's already told that it can't establish its own identity. I had a great time with this one, and I'm very happy the show has been renewed for a second season, even if I really wish it was more than 8 episodes. The largest part of that excitement, at least for me, is the ghoul, a character that both riffs on classic western tropes while embodying some of the genre's most interesting elements, and I can't wait to see where they take him going forward.
In the wasteland, knowledge is power. It's the difference between leading a faction to victory or being taken down by a feral. Now, uh, thankfully it's not quite that intense in the real world yet, but learning is always important. Brilliant has made the process of learning more fun and less painful than ever before. You tackle math, science, and computer science concepts in a highly, highly interactive way. There's thousands of lessons to be found here, with new ones being added constantly, and spending just 30 minutes a day or so on them is both fun and builds our skills without any of the stress that you might remember associating with these topics. A really great recent addition is the data analysis focused classes, like Introduction to Probability, which uses probability to represent and interpret data and events effectively. You know, something that the unsuspecting residents of Vault 33 could have really used. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash midnight or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. That's brilliant.org slash Slash midnight. Here's a special tip for the fellows and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun but loads of free gifts and prizes too.